The Ghost of William Corder's Skull Written and read by Christopher Horton Gregory Aspatch was a rather spoilt fellow. He had been fortunate many years back to be the only beneficiary of his father's will, and as a sole surviving member, he was able to live in a luxuriously large rambling Georgian townhouse situated on the nice side of Bury St Edmunds in Suffolk, and with only his housekeeper and Mrs Milne as company. His drawing room served as his base for a lifetime preoccupation of collecting anything connected with the paranormal. The room, although spacious, allowed little room to move, as around his desk the floor and shelves were piled high with esoteric oddities that he had collected throughout his entire life. And as such, access between the groaning collection of books, manuscripts and objets d'art was very difficult. There was but a narrow corridor scarcely wide enough for one person to pass. Despite his housekeeper's many protestations, he had resisted any challenges to declutter that room, as his collection served as reference and study material for his career as a writer of paranormal books, and without it his work would be left in jeopardy. So what made matters worse, Mrs Milne thought, was that there was a never-ending stream of callers to his home, offering even more material, as Aspach was known to be a rather a soft touch and very generous. It was during the afternoon of the wet mid-April in 1957 that he was alone in the house when he received a visitor, a rather shifty-looking type, whose unkempt and scruffy appearance made him look more like a man of the road rather than as he claimed, which was as a gravedigger working for a local cemetery. This man, who spoke in a rich Suffolk accent, was wearing a flat cap and holding with one hand the handle of a large, battered and rusty Japan metal case. He removed his cap and said, Forgive me, sir, my name is Dan Sykes, and I recently discovered this box while working in the cemetery at St Giles. It be buried in a new grave space I was digging. He then offered Aspatch the case and added, There is something inside which I'm sure you might like. This case I can say was buried illegally, as there are no records that exist to explain a presence there. For fear of getting his hands dirty, he reluctantly accepted it by holding the handle with a handkerchief before resting the box in the hallway. Having invited Sykes into his home, he opened the Japan case, which was large enough to serve as a case for a top hat. And inside, he saw a rather large skull of a man which appeared to have its lower jaw wide to the upper. He thought that to be very odd, as this is a method used by medical schools to display human skeletons. The skull looked as though it had been buried for quite some years, as the case around it was very badly corroded. He also discovered a small handwritten note wrapped in greased paper, which read, Leave well be, it will summon the dead. The note immediately piqued his interest. At first he assumed the skull was probably removed during some recent building work to preserve St Giles Church, which, as he recalled, was an abandoned medieval country ruin still used for burials and located in West Suffolk. He turned sternly towards Sykes and said, Now listen here, my good man. If this was stolen from a hospital or grave, I will report this to the police and the county coroner. This is your last chance to walk away if it isn't as you say. Sykes, still holding his cap nervously in front of him, implored, I tells you the truth. I ain't no thief nor lawyer. I heard about you from reading one of your books, and you asked in it for anyone to contact you here if they have something of interest. So that's why I came here right away in me work clothes. Pointing towards the paper in Aspach's hand, he added, that note was inside, and the case and skull were found in the spot not used for burials. So I thought I'd give you first refusal. I only want a fiver for it, and with that I'll be gone. Having been satisfied by Sykes' earnest plea, he handed over five pounds and a bonus of one pound as a show of good faith to keep quiet about this. 
Sykes rolled the two notes excitedly and put them into his pocket. He put on his cap and said, Thank you, sir, a true gentleman. With a smile, he bade Asbach good day, and on leaving said, My lips are sealed, trust me, I'd lose my job if this got out. After hurriedly leaving, Asbach closed the heavy front door as he collected the encased skull from the hallway. He then put the skull into a cardboard box as he didn't want to frighten Mrs. Milne any further than he has already done so over the years, and then dispose of the case into the waste bin outside. Asbash was very curious about the skull and an ominous note which appeared to have been written in some haste by a trembling hand in pencil. Still not fully convinced that this wasn't an elaborate trick being played on him, he left the note on his desk beneath a paperweight. During the night and around 1am, he was roused from his sleep by an excited and frightened Mrs. Milne, who rapped his door repeatedly, shouting, Did you not hear a loud crash from the drawing room, sir? Ashbatch quickly put on his dressing gown, after shouting to Mrs. Milne that he was coming immediately. Grabbing a flashlight, he opened the door to find Mrs. Milne in her nightie and dressing gown, shaking quite noticeably. Sir, you must call the police. I'm sure I heard someone walking around in there. Summoning the courage to walk down the sweeping brass railed staircase that so adorns these large townhouses of the 18th century, he nervously stepped down the staircase shouting, You better go! I have a gun! When he reached the bottom, he could hear shuffling heavy feet and a mumbling sound coming from within the closed door of the drawing room. He quickly flung the door open and aimed the lit flashlight into the shadows of this room. Knowing that physical access here was restricted, he flashed the light along the narrow access way to his desk and was shocked to see a large grinning skull sat on it and facing towards him. He dropped the flashlight upon seeing it as its hollowed and gloomy eye sockets seemingly stared disdainfully towards this intrusion. Mrs. Milne, meanwhile, entered the room and quickly turned on the lights. Upon looking within, neither could see any other persons present, and upon seeing the skull, she screamed, That skull gave me a fright! Where did that come from? Asbach assured her, I had forgot I had left the skull out for examination in the morning, as it's part of a research project I'm working on. So, Mrs. Milne, there's no need to worry. He smiled and added, I must admit, this skull gave me quite a jolt, too. Mrs. Milne, quite openly scornful of Ashbatch's somewhat lame excuse, shook her head and replied, Better tell that to the police. I called. They will be here shortly. I'm off to bed with a stiff brandy. With that, she shuffled into the gloom of the hallway and ascended the staircase. After the police had called and checked the property, they left assured all was in order, having advised Aspash to install an intruder alarm which would alert the police immediately to any intruders. It was something he had considered for some time, although now he questioned what he initially heard and saw. Aspach returned to the skull which still rested on his desk and decided to make inquiries in the morning by checking his files for any clue that might elicit the original source. The noises in the drawing room he put down to his own imagination and perhaps he genuinely had forgotten that he had left the skull on the desk in the first place. Feeling too tired to think further, he returned to his bed for a somewhat restless night, until the morning, whereupon after breakfast, he cleared another corridor to his bookcase in the drawing room. He then recalled a story from a book written by a local author, a man by the name of Robert Thurston Hopkins, and entitled Adventures with Phantoms which gave actual reference to the case of a William Corder, who was executed by public hanging at Oldbury Jail. According to an entry on page 15, there is a reference to Corder's skull, which, if to be believed, was stolen by a respected local physician, a Dr. Kilner, who had surreptitiously exchanged the skull for another, as it was left on display as a teaching aid for young doctors and nurses at West Suffolk Hospital. Kilner apparently crept into the hospital late one night and removed the skull while working under candlelight conditions. And according to the book, a breeze from nowhere kept blowing out the candles, making his task much more difficult. 
This initially played on his nerves, but he managed to brush it off as a mild hysteria and was able to make the exchange. Also, according to the book, Calder later made a number of ghostly visits to Kilner's home to demand the return of his skull and was once seen by a domestic maid to look like a real person, although rather oddly dressed in old-fashioned clothes. Kilner was not at first so willing to comply and it was only through a run of bad luck and other events that he experienced, which convinced him to dispose of the skull to appease Calder. Realizing that the hospital may ask questions, any notion of return there was completely out of the question. Instead, Kilner turned to his friend, the father of Thurston Hopkins, who actually resided in the former governor's house, which stands inside the walls of the now defunct jail. He believed that by burying it near to the scene of his execution, Corder would leave both him and Thurston Hopkins in peace. Thurston Hopkins Sr. at first agreed to help, but no sooner had he accepted it than his fortunes too turned for the worst. In desperation to resolve this curse, he put the skull into a Japan metal case and paid a local gravedigger to dispose of it quietly by unofficially burying it in the sanctified grounds of an old churchyard known as St Giles. From that moment onwards, all hauntings had ceased and the Thurston Hopkins family, as well as Dr Kilner, were able to live the rest of their lives in peace. Aspatch was well aware of the William Calder legend, having visited the museum at Moises Hall, where dried portions of the executed Calder's scalp were on display here as with a book on the trial which was bound in Calder's skin. He also recalled his death mask which portrayed the last throes of a condemned man. All in all, the murder of Mariah Martin and the execution of Calder on August the 11th, 1828 were big stories in this largely rural area and as many as 12,000 people had flocked from far afield and apparently took over half an hour for him to die as it necessitated the hangman, Foxton, to weigh down his body with his own to finish his life. Corder, whose choking and screams were found unsettling to the ladies who had gathered at the execution scene, were relieved to see that he was dispatched more quickly. Asbach then turned to the missing skull. He mused quietly. So is this undoubtedly Corder's actual skull? A cold chill ran down his spine like a shock of electricity. Warned about the possible repercussions of owning such a skull and its alleged dark powers quite simply terrified him. And yet he had to learn more. Perhaps this skull may be a key to revealing the afterlife. For the next few days, whilst Asbash was contemplating yet another visit from Corder, he received news that a small electrical company that he had shares in was struggling to survive following the loss of a contract in India and it looked likely to fold with the loss of 20 local jobs which troubled him deeply. The potential loss of the investment was small compared to his fortune but the thought that the skull may be responsible spurred him into action. He contacted in London a physicist and a fellow student of the paranormal, a Professor Wilkins, who had spent years attempting unsuccessfully to form a psychic bridge between this world and the next and Aspash thought that the potential offered by the skull may be the very portal to determine his theories on the afterlife. Wilkins, when contacted by telephone, was extremely excited by the events relayed to him by Aspash, and at his invitation, Wilkins agreed to spend some days at his home in Bury St Edmunds to assess the potential of what was believed to be called a skull. That night, Asbash and Mrs Milne retired to their respective bedrooms and settled down to sleep. At 1am, Asbash was awoken from his sleep by the sound of someone pacing up and down in the corridor outside his room. He at first assumed it was Mrs Milne and had called after her. The footsteps stopped immediately. He then opened his bedroom door with a flashlight in hand and quickly scanned the light up and down the corridor there was nobody to be seen. He then sat up in bed with some nervous apprehension to what may happen next. Sleeping was now clearly out of the question as there was something plainly amiss. Mrs Milne would not have acted in such a manner 
and if she did, then an explanation would have been forthcoming. He was fairly certain, therefore, that the noises were caused by Calder's restless spirit, and was fearful as to what may happen next. Despite staying awake for a couple of hours, he quickly succumbed to sleep, and awoke at 9am when a cheerful Mrs Milne called into his room with his breakfast and the morning newspapers. As he accepted the breakfast tray from Mrs Milne, he thanked her and added, Did you hear any noises during the night? She replied, Only your snoring, but I soon fell to sleep. Without adding anything further, he told Mrs Milne to prepare a guest room, as he was expecting a Professor Wilkins over the next couple of days. Will he be staying long, sir? She inquired. Not really sure at the moment, Mrs Milne. We have a considerable amount of work to go through. Mrs Milne then reminded Aspatch that she was away later in the day to travel to Dis, as she had plans to stay with her sister who was living in that Norfolk town. Aspatch reassuringly replied, As this was arranged some weeks ago, I have to be honest, Mrs Milne, I had forgotten. But, but no worries, I can survive a week without your company. Please do pass my felicitations to your sister. Later that day, Aspash was interrupted by an engineer from a local alarm company, who had called at the behest of the police to advise and install a complete burglar alarm system covering every external door and window. The system took some hours to install and finish, and at the end of it, the engineer instructed Aspash how to turn on and off the alarm, and if necessary, how to reset it. He also reminded Aspash that the system was linked through to the local police station, should it be activated. Thanking the engineer as he left, Ashpash turned on the system as it was quite late in the day and wasn't expecting any visitors during the late hours. However, at 8 p.m. that night, he heard a loud thud from the hallway. It was someone calling at the house. Upon opening the door after resetting the alarm, he was shocked to see Professor Wilkins, a diminutive figure of a man in his late fifties. He noted that he was holding a battered brown leather luggage case and looking somewhat dishevelled in a crumpled and wrinkled tweed suit with his tie askew and slightly off dead centre to reveal a row of half-buttoned shirt. Wilkins broke Aspatch's apparent trance by saying, May I come in, Mr Aspatch? You are expecting me, are you not? Aspatch quickly recovered himself from looking at the scruffy and bespectable professor and helped him carry his luggage. Sorry, Professor, I wasn't expecting you so imminently. Although my housekeeper, Mrs Milne, has provided you with a clean room to stay in. Mumbling under his breath, Professor Wilkins hauled his case up the stairs to his allotted room. Later, they met up again in Aspatch's drawing room by his desk. Aspatch rather excitedly lifted a cardboard box from under his desk where he invited Professor Wilkins to remove and inspect it. He also tried to show Wilkins the note that accompanied the skull, but that was found to be missing from beneath the paperweight. That's very odd, remarked Aspatch. I left that note under the paperweight from the day I took this relic in, but now it appears to be missing. Wilkins replied dismissively, You shared the note with me on the telephone. Perhaps it will show up somewhere else. These things often turn out like that, you know. After examining the skull with a rather eccentric-looking monocle, Wilkins concluded, Well, it's certainly that of a man in his twenties, and it has a patina which suggests age. But I can't understand why it's wide to the lower jaw. Are you sure it's conclusively the skull belonging to William Corder? Aspatch replied, well, my research points to a number of facts which can be read in Thurston Hopkins' book. They are that it was stolen from an anatomical skeleton, hence the wire. It was recovered in a Japan metal box, also referred to in the book. And lastly, it matches by age and sex, which could be attributed to Corda. Wilkins, while scanning the skull, commented with a smile. I think you may be right, Mr Aspatch, I really do. During dinner, both men discussed at length the legend of Corder and his hauntings, and particularly how the skull would benefit Wilkins' own research. 
It was clear that Aspatch wanted the skull to go, as he now perceived it to be a nuisance. But knowing Wilkins' own interest, he decided to offer a wager. If Wilkins was prepared to sit the night out with the skull, it would be his by morning. Wilkins' face lit up, and he quickly responded with an outstretched right hand. It is a deal! Let's shake on it! he added as they shook hands. I was going to suggest this myself. I've read of Thurston Hopkins' experiences, and this may open a portal that I can use in my own research work. Absolutely capital, Mr. Aspatch. I will sit with it from 10pm tonight, and will report to you accordingly. Later that evening, Aspatch retired to bed, and left Professor Wilkins a cup of tea and sandwiches, as he elected to sit with it in the drawing room. Rather predictably, perhaps, Aspatch couldn't sleep, and he was certain that the skull would once more play mayhem. But past 1am in the morning, he heard only silence. Curiously, and concerned for Professor Wilkins, he crept downstairs and entered the drawing room, where he found the professor sat staring almost hypnotically at the skull on the desk in front of him. The skull bore a seeming luminosity as it stared through empty sockets at Wilkins. The professor seemed completely transfixed, and the sandwiches Aspatch had left earlier sat untouched on the desk, along with a now very cold cup of tea. Just as he was about to shake Wilkins, a loud crash came from behind as a large column of books stacked up in the corner came tumbling down. In the half-light, he saw a man wearing old-fashioned clothing and a beaver-skin hat walking out from the drawing room and into the hallway. He quickly regained hold of his senses and followed this missy-like form, which stopped briefly, dipped his hat with a cruel smirk, and disappeared. He returned to Wilkins, who appeared to be back to normal, and staring at his pocket watch. Good God, Wilkins exclaimed. Look at the time. And he continued. I thought I'd been here for th only 30 minutes. I was staring at the eye sockets, which appeared to glow slightly. And now you're here. And a few hours appear to be missing too. He fell back into the chair and looked up at Aspatch as he continued in a somber voice. You really must get rid of this skull. It is pure evil. I can remember, he momentarily hesitated, and appearing confused, said, I saw an execution with a young man swinging from a suspended rope. Yes, I do remember. I saw in graphic detail Corder's execution and a tremendous rage and anger. He paused as Aspatch noted a faint reddening mark around Wilkins' neck and exclaimed, are you sure it was Corder, Professor Wilkins? Look at your neck. Wilkins stood up, staring directly into a mirror, and was rubbing the reddening mark around his neck. Oh my God! he exclaimed. Aspatch, realizing the enormity of power that the skull possessed, replied, We must get rid of this skull. Will you help me? Wilkins, still briefly in contemplation, responded, Let's remove it back to where it was originally located. I feel only harm will come from owning this. You do know where it came from, don't you? Aspatch replied, Yes, I know the cemetery very well. We can go there before dark and put it into a hole to be rid of it. Wilkins retorted, But if we do, nobody must know. I've been engaged in paranormal research now for the better part of 30 years, and never have I occasion to come across something as palpably evil as this. After both retired to their respective beds for a sleepless night, they met later in the day in the drawing room where Aspatch had reboxed the skull into a wartime munitions box, leaving within a salutary warning note. If you find me, please leave alone or I will make your life a misery. Having placed both the skull and note within, he welded the box permanently sealed within a workshop in the old stable block. 
and transferred the box into the trunk of his 1951 Citroen saloon, which was parked outside with the engine running. He also included two spades to bury the box and its unholy contents. By now he was joined by Wilkins as they set off to the ruins of Old St Giles Churchyard, which lay a few miles distant. Having arrived some 20 minutes later, they ensured there were no other visitors while the box and skull were taken to a quiet corner where both men proceeded to dig a very deep hole, just wide enough to hide the skull. After a few minutes toil with the box safely deposited, they filled the hole as it was starting to turn dark. Feeling relieved and pleased, both men failed to observe the presence of a solitary figure silhouetted in the gloom of a gathering fog and perhaps aided to secrecy by the failing light. The misty figure had a menacing aura of luminescent glow, but both men were too busy to note its presence, nor indeed the fact that it was slowly moving towards them. Two days later, Mrs Milne returned back to the house to discover it seemingly empty. Despite frantic calling and checking each room, there were no other persons in the property, and Asbach's car was missing. She noted that in the drawing room it was left in somewhat of a disarray, with a pile of books lying in a fallen heap, and a desk with some uneaten sandwiches and a very, very cold cup of tea lay on top. After a few hours she decided to call the local police to report her employer missing, but before she could lift the heavy Bakelite telephone handset, a knock was heard at the door. Upon answering, she was met by a man dressed in a casual suit who identified himself as Detective Inspector Dryden from Bury St Edmunds Police. Having made a formal introduction, Mrs Milne ushered the police officer inside, who informed her in somewhat sombre tones that her employer was discovered that morning hanging from a tree in the ruins of St Giles Churchyard with another man. He appeared to have died by hanging and as he was but a few short feet from the ground, the process of dying from strangulation and asphyxiation must have taken some time to effect. In short, a very unpleasant death. He then reached into his pocket and pulled out a handwritten note which Mrs Milne identified as the writing of Asbash. Inspector Dryden then read the note which he assumed was some form of suicide note which read, If you find me, please leave well alone or I will make your life a misery. Mrs Milne stated to the officer that her employer's business interests had of late fallen into hard times and that he may well have committed suicide because of it. Although she was aware that he had a guest, a Professor Wilkins, staying with him at the time. Detective Inspector Dryden added, Well, he intoned, the strangest part of the strange is that Professor Wilkins who we believe was an acquaintance of his, was found dead hugging the hanging body of Mr. Ashbash from the waist. We think he assisted in his suicide and died from a heart attack. As his face was stricken with a terror I have never ever seen on a corpse. He concluded, We aren't looking for anyone else, Mum, but we believe this to be an assisted suicide and death by natural causes, although the coroner will probably have the last word to say on this, but the note he left is odd to say the least. A few days later, after all police inquiries were completed, the coroner's verdict recorded a suicide and death by heart attack. The case was now closed. It is said that in later years nobody would enter St Giles's churchyard after dark, as it was claimed to be haunted by Aspach and Wilkins. And it is legend that should anyone feast their eyes upon a third ghost in an old-fashioned beaver skin hat, then they would immediately be struck dead. It is believed that this phantom protects an unmarked grave in one corner of the churchyard, although the burial register claims there are no recorded burials there. Quite how or where this legend came from, nobody knows, but following two further apparent suicides from ghost hunters in the churchyard, Nobody is prepared to find out for themselves. Are you? The End